All right, everyone, welcome to the show. Tennessee Wildcast, Tennessee yeah. Wildlife Resources Agency weekly podcast show. Glad to have you. Jason Harmon, I'm Doug Markham. Good to be here, Doug. Good to be here. Just got off of Dove Field the other day and telling one of my friends before the show started, I wasn't counting any birds this year. I was just taking photographs. That's all I'm going to do. <laughs> How about yeah. you? There wasn't a whole lot of photographs to take. The you birds know, were kind of slim this year. But. At the fields I were on did okay, but I left them early, both of them, so I could go one to the next or whatever. And they were shooting pretty good in, this in middle Tennessee. But typical dove season, some fields that are hot and some that are very not. Yep. And, uh, but you got a long way to go in the season yet. So. Yeah. you got plenty of time to get out there and chase them around. And yeah. And it's not cold yet, that's for sure, wherever you are. Yeah. It's, so a, we, it's a hot September. It is. It is. We've got a good show for you today. We'll introduce our guest in a minute. Let's talk about a couple of things real quick. Okay. Uh, waterfowl hunters, this is your time of year where you can get out and, and at least get ready for the big season. we got another season opening up for you guys and – it's uh, the wood duck and teal season opens up Saturday. Yes. And what's it go for? You got it up there somewhere. Goes yeah. for what, about five days. And bag limit, I believe, on this is uh, it's a little bit more than I thought it was. I think it's a total of six, but no more than if 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 I recall two wood ducks. That's correct. So make sure you check out the guide. Gives you a little chance to get out there. You've had the goose season going on. Now you got this going on, and uh, um, getting you ready for when you get back out there. In November. That's page 18 in your guide. Page 18 in the guide. That's right. Quick reference so, there. A lot of stuff you see on that. That's small game. A lot of things are going to be opening in the next oh, six weeks or so. Um, so. But for now, just get out and enjoy what you can. Get out there and, and chase those doves. And there's one other thing starting in two weeks, though, that – Deer season. Yeah, that's going to get a lot of folks interested. Yeah, that's what everybody's looking for. I've seen our website. That's been a lot of the hits on our website here lately. It is. Folks are wanting to know what's what the rules and regs and season dates and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, the guide's out there. Um, September 24th is when it starts. Right. And you got just about every day in October. I think the kids hunt right at the last weekend or so in October, mm -hmm. uh, the juvenile hunt. But a lot of archery time between now and then. Make sure you check out the guide because there's some unit changes and – Two bucks a year. Make sure you understand that, and but just study the guide for a few minutes. And if you are somebody that wants to get out and and shoot archery and practice, just you can call your regional offices and find out what might be local. I know in Middle Tennessee, there's a there's over in Franklin or Cool Springs, we call it that area right in there. There's a there's an archery range that's open every day for you to go out there, even if you don't hunt. If you just want to go out there and practice, it's a cool little range. Uh, out at the agriculture center there mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of that kind of stuff across the state yep so stones river here in middle tennessee is a big range and that's exactly if you want right. to get your gun sight in early for that time of year yeah and they have an archery range too they just do. uh it's just um shooting the targets but mm -hmm. it's right there beside where the everybody else shoots with their guns so there's all kinds of that potentially out there and speaking of ranges since you brought it up mm -hmm. well you brought uh, it up oh did you did i bring it up okay <laughs> uh, there's a a, a the commission, when they met, and we hadn't talked about this yet, when they met a couple of weeks ago, they made a real change or whatever term they applied to it. But if you are a licensed holder in Tennessee and you're going to shoot your rifle or your whatever, it, it, any of these ranges that are unmanned, that don't have an everyday, like Stones River is manned every day and when they're open and a lot of cost to, to run it. But if it's an unmanned one, like a Cheatham WMA here in Middle Tennessee or Yanali WMA, they're listed in this guide, and they're easy to tell in this guide. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to buy a fee anymore. You don't have to pay a fee anymore. Right. You just go if it's unmanned. And so that's a good thing they did. If you have a license from Tennessee. If you have a license from Montana, you still got to buy the fee. <laughs> so anyway. It's a long way to come sight in a, a rifle or you shoot your never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and if you haven't taken hunter education yet, you better hurry. So there's courses good. The man we're going to talk to in a minute teaches a bunch of them. We're here to talk about fish today a lot. But we'll touch on that hunter education stuff, too, because yeah. he does a whole lot of it. And let's widen out and, and introduce him. Yeah. Mr. Bones. This is Daryl Byrne. Bones, we call him. And uh, been around the agency almost as long as I have, maybe a little longer. I don't know. Mm, about the same year, I think. We got it's pretty, it pretty close. Uh, according pretty close. to the time program Edison, I'm now officially 30 years in. So You are 30 <laughs> years in. Well, okay. I've only been here like 10, 12 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, we've both been here a long time. And yeah, no, uh, this is growing Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably hit you with it in a minute. But anyway, we've been here both a long time, Bones, and you've worked in fisheries for a lot of that career. <laughs> and you're just going to hear that noise because our building's being worked on. So yeah. just hang in there, folks. Yeah, we've heard it a lot. <laughs> anyway, 
Uh, you've been here a long time, mostly in fisheries, but you do teach hunter education courses. Yes. You spend a lot of time, your what could be free time, really helping out folks. And hunter education has been important. You tell us about it real quick and and um, why folks need to get it now. Uh, if you don't get in now, classes start filling up. The class for September the 17th, which is the field day class at Stones River, is already full with 50 students. The uh, Everybody waits to the last minute. Uh, this when, is across the state, this too. Is right? across the state. This is across the state. And, you know, we only have 1,200 instructors, and we can't have a class every weekend. And it, it, when we do have classes, they do fill up. And uh, if you go ahead and get them in them now, the be you're better off and you're ready and set and go. I had a gentleman call me last night saying, I'm going into Canada Saturday. Can I get my hunter education? Uh, and I'm <laughs> like, no. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. And you do have adults that run into it in, in this time of year when they're going out to Colorado and different That's places. gone on since you and I started, too, yes, if yeah. not before then. Uh, you know, after 103 classes in the last three years, you know, it never Golly. ceases to amaze, amaze me how many people wait to the last minute on the hunter safety. And classes. no matter how much we tell them. No and matter how much and we tell them. them. Yeah. And Bones is, was, a couple of years ago, was named, uh, I think you were named Violet, our uh, instructor of the year, excuse me. Mm, 2013, I think me and Faye Hickerson shared that award. But without the volunteers, we, we wouldn't uh. be able to do it. If people don't realize between just the ones I work with, Eddie Cothran and Philip Ware and, and, and uh, Chris Johnson and uh, David Cole, from, uh, just people from all around the middle state that, I, that I've had the pleasure to work with on classes and, and at the instructor workshop. We wouldn't be able to do it without our 1,200 volunteer instructors. That's how many. Uh, Director Carter was on there last week, and he talked some about that, yes. but I didn't know it was that many. 1,200 yes. volunteer instructors across the state. Yes. That's awesome. Well, you all do a great job, and it is time to take it. And the Bones, do you recommend that people come in and, and, and come to the traditional classroom like you and Faye Hickerson teach, or is that online course pretty good? The online course is real good, but due to the simple fact you do have to pay for it for twenty four ninety five, I think is what it's going right. We do recognize two of them on the Internet now. Uh, the, uh, the traditional course where you're there four, five, three days, just depending uh, on how the instructor sets up the class, you get more hands-on approach. You get more one-on-one -on -one participation. On that field day, we have back-to-back -back field days a lot of time at Stones River, and I don't have the time to sit down and instruct maybe a, a smaller child who has not been proficient enough to mm -hmm. uh, show his ability. And you know, a lot of times I have to sit and read the test to him and everything, and, which is no problem on a traditional class because we do have the time. But on the online course, when it's backed up like that, I don't have the time, and mm -hmm. we're underneath that time constraint. And uh, that online course will take you seven to eight hours because each chapter is timed. You can go in there and answer the question, but you're still going to wait 20 or 30 seconds before that timer counts off before you can move on. Okay, so you can't cheat. You can't cheat. <laughs> you can't. You don't want, you want your kids to get the best education they can and be safe out there in the woods, so in the, in the field, wherever you go. Uh, all right, Bones, we're, we're here mainly to talk about fish. And, and this is a time of year, a lot of people with interest are, it's in hunting, but there's a lot of folks that it's, it's back to getting on that water and catching fish. The water is going to start cooling down. And to me, the streams that you're in a lot, they, this, they don't need to cool down. They're hot right now. They're hot right now. This year has been, we had that extra dry, uh, extra wet spring. Now we've gone through this extended dry spell. In my house, I hadn't had rain in about 14, 15 days now. As the creeks have gotten lower, they've gotten clear. There's still a lot of cold creeks out there that are running, but the fish are beginning to pack up for winter. These fish know that winter's coming on. The water's dropping. October is usually our driest month of the year. And as these fish feed food in and get, get the weight added in for winter, you know, they're biting. They're ready to go. And people overlook September and October as time to get in these creeks, except for a few of the guys that I talked to on the Internet. And, and you can have a field day out there. And uh, it, you will be surprised at uh, what an ankle-deep water will hold in some of these uh, small creeks. Uh, it, it would surprise you for sure. And there's a lot of creeks. And I want to get I want to get into the krill clerk stuff here in a minute. There's a lot of creeks out there that you can fish you got to ask for permission but we're blessed with creeks in tennessee and yeah they're just now i mean they've been good all summer but they're just now even getting just yep. 
Well, you're correct. looking at uh, just in the state of Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken, you're looking at 17,000 miles of creeks mm -hmm. in, in the state of Tennessee. Duck River itself, 284 That's miles here in Middle long. Tennessee, and, right? And, uh, if, yeah, and every tributary that comes every, into every it, every little tributary yeah. coming into it, and everything. As you're looking at all those creeks and rivers, the, the you know a few of them pop up in my mind. The Garrison is a uh, it still holds our record as far as shocking. In 100 feet, we had 52 smallmouth in 100 feet. Wow. And uh, Turnbull Creek in, in West Tennessee, uh, in Dixon County there, it has an absolutely wild population of smallmouth uh, above the water treatment plant for people who, who, who know where I'm talking about. But it's, you know, those creeks that stand out in your mind is, you know, unbelievable amount of smallmouth in these creeks and uh, rivers. Uh, and, and people just are missing the opportunity when they go to the lake and don't even think about that bridge that they just passed over on I-24. Oh, I can remember years ago fishing in one a creek over in West Tennessee, and it was in April. I'm thinking all those cars passing me, our boat trucks with boats on them were going to catch crappie, and I was catching rock bass just as quick as mm -hmm. I could throw in it because I was thinking these are creek crappie, and they're going, yep. they're like creek crappie. But anyway, wonderful creeks that we have in Tennessee. And um, Bones has a book we're going to show you in a few minutes, too. If you're big time into identifying fish, because we're going to do some of this on the show, we're going to show you that. But let's talk about krill clerking okay. first. You're, you're not a krill clerk now, but no. you were a krill clerk for a long time in Middle Tennessee. And I want folks to know what a krill clerk is across the state. They are so important to what our agency does, to the data that they collect that you can help us with. Uh, so the, tell us. Krill clerks, we, we've got the Cadillac program, so krill clerks in the southeast because we man our lakes 12 months out of the year and 365 days. And now we're not out there every day, but it's a computer generated random splattering. And we go out there and we collect the information as to what you're catching. We weigh and we measure the fish. We've done so many age growth studies throughout the years that we can tell basically how old that fish is by just the length and the weight of it. And each lake is a little bit different. So that's why we have different people on those lakes. And as we roam and count those people, we get a fishing pressure on those lakes. Now, a lot of states, believe it or not, here recently have been using trail cams and replacing the personnel with trail cams and taking time-lapse photographs, but there's still a person in that office looking at those photographs and, and going through that trail cam footage saying, okay, this person popped up on hour one and he left by hour two. So we do it with people and we do it with boats and we do it with manpower. And when you are talking to these gentlemen and or ladies that we did have a lady at one time doing krill mm -hmm. and uh, you, you're providing information that the biologist are plugging in on that size limit or that krill limit and uh, making decisions based on what these people are collecting. And in the last couple of years, we've actually started doing tailwaters and checking the tailwaters. And the, one of the pictures you had that floated, mm -hmm. floated by was me on the Elk River there, so. Right. And we show Al Bartolotto on one of the photographs a minute ago, and he was doing a survey. Mm -hmm. Part of what you do, too, I know you're taking the how long you've been out here and can I see your fish and what you got and all that, but you also do surveys sometimes, We're, we're doing you? economic surveys, and we're seeing how much money that you spend as you go out fishing. We're not looking at increased prices on anything. We just want to know how much fishing is generating money-wise across the state. And I actually had a gentleman looked at me one time when I creeled him on Tensford Lake, and I said, how much money did you spend today? And he said, about $310,000. And I looked at him, and I said, do what? And he says, yeah, I just bought a house on the lake. We closed on it this morning, so I did go fishing here. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you, you'd be surprised at how many people spend lots of money, just like with the Elk, Elk River survey when we done that. We found that a large percentage of the people fishing Elk River was in the $50,000 plus range for, Economic, a, a, they're, they're with them. for the annual income yeah. of that household. And you wouldn't think a county as small as uh, Moore County and, and Lincoln County and, and Franklin County, those counties down there, which are rural, poor counties, that uh, the average income of the fishermen down there would be fifty plus thousand dollars. Well, that, that's interesting. And uh, but you also, I mean, when you do out there, are you just looking at one fish? I know I took some photographs of you a few years ago for the magazine where you were krilling trout anglers mm -hmm. so do you do cold water and warm water or do you mostly just do specifically bass 
or when you're quilling, is it about everything? It, or? It's about everything and what you're what you're ang- angling for. And I've pulled up on people who had had a ton of crappie in the boat. Why are you out here fishing for? Why am I here fishing a smallmouth? But I keep catching these crappie, so I'm keeping them. So you, you you collect data on everything, the, the amount of time that they've been out there, how much money that they spend, where they're from, the distance from their house, and things like that. And that's another thing that's beginning to pop out that people are basically and i hate to say it lazy they, they go fishing close to the house and that's another thing that's popping up in a lot of these surveys i think, that, I think that i'm lazy <laughs> i do that a lot <laughs> travel as much as i used to uh especially when you got a good lake nearby you're down in southern middle tennessee or down there a lot you got woods reservoir you got tim's ford where you're talking about you got normandy I'd be way lazy if I lived yeah. in that area down there. Well, and, and we're very fortunate as a state. You can take uh, just Nashville alone and draw a 90-mile uh, circle around Nashville, a radius around Nashville, and look at the major lakes that you hit, mm-hmm. Dale, Dale Hollow, Center Hill, Tins Ford, uh, Woods Reservoir, uh, just unbelievable amount of water. And, yes, you will get hooked on one lake and go there and, and become accustomed to it. Get and, good at it. And get good at it. Well, some people get good at it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, that's why people- you take pictures of birds instead that's of the right. birds. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, how do people act when you come up to them? How, how, how do they respond? Do you get different responses? Are people willing to work with a grill clerk, or do some of them tell you go away? 90, 90% are just ecstatic that you're checking them because they've never been checked by a game warden before. And, and we're not enforcing the law when we're doing creel. We're just trying to collect data. Now, there are officers that are out there checking things, but that's not our primary goal as a creel clerk. You're out there checking fish. You want to see what they got and then the there's five percent who are just absolutely mad because you've just interrupted them and just you know they've made them stop fishing and, and then you got another five percent who will drop the pole and run because they do think you're fixing to write them a ticket so, uh, <laughs> i but, bet they didn't buy a license that day <laughs> normally that's yeah. what happens you'll be surprised how many poles get laid on the bank and the people running hiding the weeds up there so <laughs> yeah that's something are most of them that that uh, get mad at you are they tournament fishing most of them are tournament fishermen and that's what a grill uh, a good krill clerk is going to after time recognize this guy's fishing tournament i can back off i can come back later and catch them when they're all weighing out and talk to them in and see what they've done then and and those those tournaments are on time limits and things like that and, and go ahead and count the person and, and make your roving count and and put them in your numbers but if you get a chance wait till he's through fishing for that bass club and and catch him at the ramp when he's loading out. Do you know about how many, I don't know if crew clerks talk to each other on a regular basis across the state, but do you know about how many crew clerks we have from east to west? Mm, I can't say right off the hand. I want to say like 12. There's okay. not that many. Two or three two, per two or three region, region, region yes. to cover the, all the lakes. Yeah, and, and then in, in, in my case, because Glenn and, and uh, the other guy uh, down at Normandy who's recently uh, uh, went to another job, I fill in and, and because I've done it before and, and, and can pick up the slack. So I, I'm unique in the fact that I can bounce back and forth. Uh, Todd St. John and my supervisor, Jim Pippis, allows me to do that. So Okay. And it keeps me sharp when I'm out there talking to well, the guys. Would crew clerks, though, over in the eastern part of the state, I guess they're looking at, I mean, we showed a photo of you a minute ago with a guy holding walleye mm-hmm. that had been caught on tailwater down in southern middle Tennessee. But Crew clerks over in Zach's East Tennessee. Gonna be mad, Zach's going to be mad at you. Yeah, we we're not going to say exactly <laughs> where he was. I will tell you, I went back and had a pretty good day, too. <laughs> Maybe not quite that good, but pretty darn good day. Uh, but anyway, that was crew clerking from the bank. Do that's you do cr- a lot of crew clerking from the bank? Or we, do we? Normally, we don't. Uh, w- that's something that just got started because when you do creel, you want to do it exactly repeated the same way over and over again, okay? And, and you want to do it totally at random. And, and when you're working from the bank, you're kind of trapped as to what spots you can go to and things like that. So it's not totally at random when you're working from the bank like that, but you still are getting data. Okay. And, and any data is good data, even if it's a big fat zero for that day. And it's iced over, which I've had days out well, there yeah. on Woods Reservoir where there was a sheet of ice on the whole lake. And, and my supervisor came up, called me up and says, you mean there's not a single boat out there? And I said, no, it's about four inches of ice. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. You ever have those days, though, boats, where you know it's going to be special, where, where you checking it and it's one of those days where everything's just, I don't know if, this, if the wind's out of the south and there's a full moon or whatever, where you start checking them. And every boat has fish. Yes. Do those days it, happen? Those days happen. And, and as a crappie fisherman, my favorite 
fish was the crappie. So I'm I'm logging in my little notebook over here where all the crappie guys are at. <laughs> and and throughout the ten years that I, I did it on a regular basis, the third week of January was the best week of the year. Come and, on, and the third week of the January. The third week of January. So yeah. when you're waiting for the dogwoods to bloom, you're done way too late. Yeah. And it's unbelievable that you, you, the 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 habits that you get in used to get into and then you start logging everything a lot of guys would look at me and one of the best fishermen i know he's done passed away now was clyde hill oh, on yeah. woods reservoir yeah. but he logged everything every day he'd take out his little book it's like temperature 78 water fairly clear and i used this and i caught that and he would go back and after 10 and 12 years he would look at those days and say oh i need to be using this right here and he would note those patterns and that you couldn't beat Clyde Hill. On with Clyde the Hill, the fish got a break. I hate that he passed away, of course, but they got a break when Clyde Hill passed yeah. away because he was one of the great fishermen down in yeah. on Woods Reservoir. And, and see, he would, he would trim his apple trees and pear trees in his yard and things like that. And that's what he sunk for, uh, for the for, brush in the lake yeah. because he said those soft woods would attract more fish now was whether it's true or not i don't know well you know a lot of fishermen go when it's comfortable for them so that's when fishing's good and and i agree that january can and i've always heard the good guides and fishermen who love crappie in february and march that's when they go out there and catch their big fish whether it's fish or deer or armadillos scouting is the key to everything and if you're not out there logging this stuff down and scouting and and going at least once a week or even just listening to radio shows and and just listening at the markets to the guys you'd be some how much information you can pick up from just talking to people and saying well what was you using today and most most fishermen are pretty honest except for that one eye one arm guy caught a fish this big yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right, all right. And let me ask you this, Bones. you got to get me back on my thought pattern after that. But uh, there's, a, there's a river down your way that maybe a lot of folks from outside of Middle Tennessee travel to. It, it's a pretty long trip from right here, but it's the Elk River. Mm -hmm. And the Elk River is a very long river. I think it runs down into Alabama. It starts out cold below uh, Timsford Dam. Timsford Dam. Well, at least the part that I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. And it's got a headwater on it, too. But what we're talking about is below Timsford Dam down into Alabama. How good a river is that? The Elk River is a real good river. Dr. Batoli doesn't think so, but it, he's, it's slowly changing his mind, too. We actually floated the upper end of the Elk River with kayaks the other day. We we are and and have seen pictures of muskie in Woods Reservoir, and the, they haven't been stopped in, since 1991. So you're looking at a 25-year-old fish, and it was 49 inches long, and it was caught this year. So as we float through woods and everything, it is a warm water, and then it comes out of woods. There's a little cool water there because woods is not that deep. Then it hits Thames, and then it, it's Thames really cold. Deep. Thames, the, Thames is 185 foot right there at the dam, a, a couple hundred yards out, and it is super cold coming out. They have injection of the oxygen going on, and it has really turned that fisheries on. That's why we have the 18-inch brown size limit. Uh, uh, so trout right there at the yeah, dam. At, the, the, at, right at the dam. And then as you slowly get past Beans Creek and flow on into Lincoln County there, it changes back over. And that part of that is because the boulder darter down there, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has mandated that the TVA change their water parameters on their releasing. And that has really picked up smallmouth. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the boulder darter is uh, without getting too much into. I remember Bob Hatcher working on that. It's sort of an endangered, <clears throat> endangered darter. You got to have a right temperature for them. You, but gotta, you're saying it's warmer down there, so you're going to see it, more smallmouth and the small rock from, from the temperature change and everything, and just from visual floating down through there and doing our electrical survey. Those those smallmouth are moving up. They're growing bigger. The, the rock bass are moving up. They're growing bigger. Okay. It is turning. It's a public water. I would urge water. people to go look at it if you're looking for a place to fish. It can yep. be. A, it can be special. So I, I just would disagree with Dr. Patel. <laughs> hey, let's let's show some fish real quick. Let's okay. show Bone. Tell me that book. He's coming back. Daryl's coming back in uh, in October, and we'll discuss some more. But in the last few minutes, I want to do some fish ID with him and talk about them. This is a book. I know it's hard. To, we can't bring you up close on it, but it's called The Fishes of Tennessee. And tell mm -hmm. it's the greatest book ever about IDing fish in the state. And we're talking about boulder daughters and things smaller than them on up to the biggest fish we got, rockfish and uh, musky and musky and everything else. It's yeah. every fish that occurs in the great state of Tennessee. It also gives a short list of the lakes and when they was built and the, the hydrological units are in there, the um, 
uh, we actually have several with the Barren River and uh, uh, the Kasanga River out of Chattanooga on the other side of the ridge. Uh, the Cumberland River, of course, the Tennessee River, the if, Mississippi if River. If it's water, baby, yeah, if it's, it's water, here. baby. It, yeah. If it's been caught in the state of Tennessee, it is in that book. David Etten and Wayne Starnes uh, are all the authors of the book. You're saying yeah. folks can get it and download it now. It is free now. If you'll just Google the fishes of Tennessee and put PDF on the end of it. PDF. For a, P, for a PDF file, uh, Adobe uh, Autocrat file, whatever. Uh, and that will give you the first link up there. It's a trace link from Tennessee EDU, and uh, you can download it for free. It's a 75 megabyte book. And That's great information. If you t- it, and there's the full text right there, 74.6 megabytes, and uh, published in 1993. They have updated it a little bit, but they're not going to update it anymore. If you want a hard it's copy, long. it's at Amazon for like 150 bucks. So. Yep. Well, I can tell yours as well because if I recall, <laughs> I've got a copy of it too, and it should be more green than it, it should, should be, be blue. More, that that and rides in the truck, and it goes in the field. So we've gone through about three of them, and of course, I can't get no more anymore. So uh, you can download it. Yeah, I can download it now so, yeah. and start printing my own. Laminate. Laminate. Let's show a couple of fish. Bones has put his hands on a Z and fish and. And uh, I want to know the difference in a couple of them, Bones. What is this? This is a rock bass. You're looking at the the, the model color and the white belly. Uh, seven to eight anal rays on it. Uh, if you notice the pectoral fin down next to my thumb, it will not touch the eye. Small mouth, it does not get past the middle of the eye. I have touched one of those in the mouth of Chisholm Creek that weighed four pounds. And that's, and that's another and that's creek in Middle wor- Tennessee. Yeah, that is a world-class record. And uh, Archie Franks, if you ever listen to the po- podcast, I know you got that fish. <laughs> <laughs> he went back and got it. He went back and got it. Mm. No, he did. All right, let's show him a warm mouth. And, uh, and I'm, I may have to help you there. Well, let's, let's show that. That's yep. a small mouth and a rock bass side by side. If you haven't been to creeks very often, you can tell the difference yeah. in them. Pretty You're looking good. at that bronze fish, those waves on the cheek. The eye will go to the center. Not the jaw will go to the center of the eye. Uh, uh, more elongated. Uh, a fighter from the word get go. I have seen real pale light ones that people confuse with spotted bass and things like that. So uh, watch out for the small mouth and the, and the waves on the cheeks and everything like that. And okay. that will tell them Let's apart. look for the one that's a warm mouth I, because these, to me, they look a little bit like a rock bass, if, if you can get. It's not the bluegill. Well, they also get confused with the, uh, the uh, uh, shadow bass, too, which we don't have in this area. Oh, no, we're they're digging. For they're digging for it. Is that all we got? I think that's it. That's Okay, we might not have the warm mouth in it. All right. Okay, well, let's, let's, look in, let's show them then a bluegill and a shellcracker. That's the bluegill right there. You want to look at the bluegill? That's a shellcracker. Okay. Uh, uh, and the shellcracker with the red ear, uh, there can be different colorations of it depending on what hatchery or, or what pond they've come from and the, and the temperature of the water. And you're looking at uh, that orange patch right there is going to that, tell you everything. That, that right? orange Do- patch on the earlobe is going to tell you everything. And then you you'll have a lot of the the uh, smaller fish that we have. Well, that's the bluegill right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you notice he does not have the uh, the red on the end of his ear, but you'll get, that get blue. That, if you got that blue. If it's got real long gated on that blue, it's a long ear sunfish. And then uh, oh. you, we have pumpkin seeds and everything else. But uh, we may do a show sometime where we just bring in. I'll just. The whole show, just bring in slides and, and uh, go over so the people understand it. Because in the spring, this is a fish that starts biting. To me, the, the, the shellcracker or, or red ear sunfish starts biting right after the crappie do. Yes. Yep. And, but right before the bluegill do. Yep. So they can, they'll can they bite at the same time and, or bed at the same time. And the strange thing start. about shellcracker, believe it or not, they will get in on a three-foot circle about 10 or 12 fish will be packed in that circle. If you don't hit that circle just right with your bait, you're not going to catch them, whereas a bluegill will be maybe 30 feet across. they all in that circle, and you would catch them anywhere. That's a great tip right there, too. Those those shell crackers seem to get concentrated on that one tight spot, and if you don't hit that spot, you don't get it. That's why they're a little tougher tougher to find, but, boy, once you find them, you've found gold. Yep. There. All right, Bones. We'll we'll do that. We'll uh, maybe in the winter sometime right before the spring we put together a show where we just identify fish. Okay. Bones is coming back in October, though. We're going to talk about winter trout fishing then and go over a few things that we touched on today a little more in detail, too. But look for them in about another three weeks. Bones, appreciate you being here. All right. You got a T-shirt, by the way. Know, Bones got a T-shirt. Got a t-shirt. Yeah. We and, we, and we gave that T-shirt away last week. Uh, 
the name slipped me. But anyway, we gave away the T-shirt. Thanks for liking and, and uh, friending us on Facebook. And We're going to do some more of that. Yeah, we'll be giving away more of those in the future. But All If right. you want to watch this show and more, just check out TennesseeWildcast.com, TNWildcast.com, or right there on our website, TNWildlife.org. So either All way, you can get to us. All our old shows are out there, too, and there's a lot of good information. We'll see you next week.